In this week's lectures, we're going to consider the question of whether it's possible to make good decisions under ignorance. Traditional decision-making frameworks don't deal with this question because they assume that we have a lot of information in advance, such as a complete list of the possible consequences of a decision. What is there to fall back on if we have to decide when we have very little information? Is it a set of moral principles? Is it always best to delay a decision if possible until we've gathered more information? Are some kinds of choices more likely to be robust, regardless of what the future brings, and if so, what kinds are they? In short, are there criteria that can guide decision-making under ignorance? But first, we need to know what a decision is. Why should we care about defining the concept of a decision? Perhaps the most obvious reason is that people can hold us accountable for our decisions. Culpability for a decision is even cemented in law. Another reason is that learning from our mistakes is possible only when we know that our action or choice actually was intentional and not caused by someone or something else. So what is a decision? Dictionary definitions refer to choosing deliberately or intentionally one alternative from a set of possible alternatives. The picture these definitions convey is that the decision maker is fully conscious and in control of the decision making process. How can we know that an act is a decision? It would seem obvious that all we need to know is whether it was made consciously and with intention. Unfortunately, it isn't that straightforward. The Devil's Dictionary by Ambrose Bierce defines decision as succumbing to one set of influences over another. Bierce is saying that we may be fooling ourselves when we believe that we have made a decision, or for that matter, when we believe someone else has made a decision. In hindsight, it seems obvious that we would like to claim as our own decisions those acts that went well, but not those that turned out badly. Accurately identifying our own decisions therefore hinges on how unflinchingly self-honest we are. Accurately identifying decisions made by someone else is even trickier. We are more likely to attribute someone else's actions solely to their intentions than we do with our own action. This difference is what psychologists call the fundamental attribution error, or more accurately, actor-observer bias. It springs from a tendency to explain others' actions by referring to their personalities or internal states, whereas we give much more weight to external circumstances when explaining our own behaviors. One consequence is that we're more likely to believe that someone else is making a decision, a deliberate, intentional, conscious choice, than that person would believe that they are. What is not a decision? Approximately speaking, a decision involves both motivation and intention, whereas a choice requires only motivation. However, the concept of a decision has fuzzy boundaries. It depends on whose theory or framework is involved. Some cognitive psychologists say that unconscious or habitual selections are not really decisions or choices because they lack conscious intent, whereas others refer to automatic thinking and yet still call that decision-making. How is decision-making dealt with in various disciplines? Many scholars and researchers from antiquity onward have considered the capacity to decide as the embodiment of a uniquely human capacity for intentional, self-reflexive action. Religious and moral philosophical systems all contain prescriptions for how we should make decisions and often also descriptive models of how people actually decide. The past 60 years have seen a strongly increased interest in decision-making, especially in psychology and economics. This is the case not only in academia, but also across government and industry. Why the increased interest? Ignorance has a central place in most of the main reasons for this. Indeed, an ignorance explosion has driven interest in how best to make decisions when we lack relevant information. First. In the last several decades, several societies have moved from dictatorial to more democratic forms of government, making new sets of choices available to citizens. Second, increased affluence and technological advances have changed people's lives and raised their expectations, again, widening the range of decisions citizens have to make. Third, the increased pace of social and technological change has increased the need to make decisions in novel environments whose characteristics are largely unknown. 
In many instances, governmental policies and laws have not been able to keep pace, so the constraints they previously placed on decisions have been loosened. Fourth, the increased complexity of social and technological systems has led to increasingly narrow specialization, which has meant having to rely more on other specialists' judgments and decisions. In turn, lay people have responded with demands for guarantees that the specialist decision-making methods are valid and reliable. Finally, we have increased awareness of both risks and opportunities through mass media and more recently via the internet, and also of irreducible unknowns. We receive much more news about risks to our health, the economy, the environment, and a host of other concerns than was the case several decades ago. Let's now look at an ideal decision-making process where the decision-maker has all the information required to make an informed, well-justified decision. First, the decision-maker must know what is, is to be decided. Second, the decision-maker has to know all the alternatives from which to choose. The decision-maker then needs a comprehensive understanding of the possible consequences of choosing each alternative, and the decision-maker must be able to rank those consequences in terms of preferences. Finally, the decision-maker should know how likely each of these consequences is to occur if a particular alternative is chosen. In short, the decision-maker has to know a lot in order to make an informed, justifiable decision. If you know all these things, that is, you know all the available alternatives, the possible consequences of choosing each one, the probability that each of those consequences will occur, and your preferences for each of those consequences relative to one another, then subjective expected utility theory developed in economics provides a neat algorithm enabling you to make the optimal decision. The major point I'm making about subjective expected utility theory is that it requires all of the foregoing to be known in advance. As you know, many real decisions involve considerably more unknowns than this. When those unknowns enter into the picture, we can't use the neat algorithm. Let's finish by looking at different ways unknowns influence decision-making, taking each step in the ideal decision-making process in turn. First, we cannot know all the alternatives, but the set of alternatives defines the decision to be made. Suppose you're going to a market to purchase some fruit. When you arrive, you find that the fruit section offers you several varieties of melons, apples, pears, peaches, nectarines, oranges, bananas, and grapes. Your initial decision, therefore, is which kinds of fruit to buy. But suppose instead, when you arrive, you find that there are only apples. Gala, Pink Lady, Granny Smith, Red Delicious, Early Red, Macintosh, Baldwin. Now your decision is which kinds of apple to buy. Or suppose when you arrive, there is no fruit at all. In that case, your decision becomes whether to try another market. Where ignorance comes in is that before you arrive at the market, you may not know what kind of decision you'll be making because you don't know what fruits will be on offer, if any. To recap, the set of alternatives defines the decision to be made. Another way alternatives come into play is if the decision maker knows that at least some new alternatives may become available in the future. Then the decision becomes altered in a fundamental way, namely whether to choose from the current set or wait for something better to come along. Recently, a friend of mine, after a year of job seeking, decided to take the job being offered to him rather than wait to see whether a better job opportunity might show up. To his chagrin, a better opportunity to show up two months after he'd made his decision. Second, we generally don't know all the possible consequences. A colleague of mine recently has had to decide whether to accept a position offered to him at a university in another country. The position was very attractive and no doubt would advance his career. He had become disillusioned with his current position and was looking for new opportunities. But his wife has health problems that require specialist care. Would the same quality of care be available if they moved? Also, one of his children is in secondary school and the other in primary school. Would good schools be available? And how would the children deal with leaving their friends and having to find new friends? Third, we usually cannot assign probabilities to the outcomes. I won't go into the extensive psychological literature on probability judgments here, but we'll make just two brief observations from that literature. First, 
Many people prefer to express their ideas about how likely an event is in verbal rather than in numerical terms. This is the case even in professional domains such as criminal law, where it might seem reasonable to assign a numerical value to a standard of proof such as beyond reasonable doubt. Second, in many real-world decisions, it seems unfeasible to, to assign numerical, let alone precise, probabilities to events, especially when those events are unique. Consider my colleague attempting to assign a number to the probability that his teenage son will adapt well to moving to a different country. Finally, preferences are probably the trickiest part of the puzzle to pin down, especially in relatively simple decisions because they can be influenced by the way that alternatives are framed, preferences elicited, default rules, and social interactions. There's a large body of research demonstrating that preferences can be changed or even reversed by eliciting them in alternative ways. For instance, a default opt-out rule, whereby an employer automatically allocates a percentage of employees' salaries to the retirement savings accounts, results in greater particip participation rates for saving for retirement than an opt-in rule, requiring employees to request that the employer make the same allocation. In the following lectures this week, we're going to focus on decision-making when ignorance prevents us from using subjective expected utility theory or its algorithmic cousins. We're going to find out whether there are any guides for making good decisions under ignorance.